Have you ever asked yourself what you should do to help your birds through their molt? In this episode of the Poultry Keepers podcast, we're going to give you the scoop on what you can do to help your birds have a less stressful and more productive molt. This episode is a portion of the Poultry Keepers 360 live stream called Managing the Moat. To reduce the overall runtime of this episode, the question and answer portion of that live stream isn't included here. So if you want to see the entire live stream, it's archived on the Poultry Keepers 360 YouTube channel under the live tab. Now here's Jeff Maddox, Karen Johnson, and myself. I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and let him explain what the heck the mold is and what it can do and what it should do and all the ins and outs about it. So Jeff, it's all yours, buddy. Thanks, Rip. So just to state the obvious, and I'm not being, you know, the mold is a natural occurrence. Every bird is going to go through at least a mold a year. Some birds go through two or three or four molds a year, but for us, you know, talking about chickens, the molt is an annual occurrence. If it happens more than once a year, something went wrong, we just need to figure it out and correct it. What we need to know about the molt, right, is the real questions are, is how effective is your molt, right? And if you do it right, the molt can be extremely effective in transforming your birds and keep them healthy for a lot, lot more generations. How long does it take? So for the average chicken, this doesn't include the heavy breeds. You know, Rip and I were just talking about it before we came on, but you're looking at about 45 to 60 days for your four or five, six pound chickens. Now your bigger stuff or your birds with a lot more plumage to them, longer tail feathers, things like that. You could be looking at 80, 85 days. You know, it's gonna take them longer to get them back to that full feather get them back to looking the way you want them to look. So you need to set your calendar and be ready to plan your mold. <clears throat> and people ask, you know, what do I do to help it? Right. So we're going to go into the in depth on this, but so really you want to, during the molt, the birds are running a fever. They're not feeling the best. They're really grumpy. You're grumpy because they look like crap. You know, they're just not the prettiest birds anymore. So. Everybody needs to keep calm. You need to do whatever you can to keep your birds as calm as possible. Keep them as comfortable as possible. Realize that they're running a couple more body degrees temperature than normal. So we need to take steps to increase the airflow, keep them comfortable, make sure that they're properly fed and watered. It's not difficult, but it just takes a little bit more understanding, you know, on the manager side to take care of it. So, you know, what is the molt for? Uh, and by the way, type in your questions whenever you have them. If I say something that triggers a question, um, we want to make sure that we get them answered. This is kind of a odd subject uh, uh, and a lot of people have questions. So yeah, don't be bashful. What's going on during the molt? And I, I don't know that everybody understands this, but so what should happen during the molt is a weight management plan. So the bird should be going through a diet and, you know, we're doing body repair. Everybody just looks at it like their birds look yucky, the feathers are falling out. They don't kind of comprehend what's really going on on the inside of that bird, but there's a real transformation going on inside the chicken, not just the feathers. So the managing factors are way. A good effective mole is the birds are going to lose somewhere between 10 and 20% of their body weight. This depends on their internal fat. Okay. Right. So we want to melt all of those internal fat deposits off during the molt or as much as we can. So that can be 10 to 20%, depending on the amount of that internal fat. We also, during this time, we want to shrink the ovaries and the testicles and get them back down to pullet size or cockerel size. So they're going to be a lot more effective. We're going to end up with better fertility and better egg production. So your hatchability should improve on if the molt went well and we did what we wanted to do. Your next round of fertility for hatching eggs should be better. 
And <clears throat> so that's what we're shooting for anyway. I want to encourage you all to take pictures of your birds. Not every bird, you know, your key birds, the birds that you have the highest level of interest in. I know you're, you're interested in all of them, but there's, everybody has their special ones. So take some good pictures, get some close ups, um, you know, different angles, different views. And we want to be able to do before and after pictures. So hopefully you can get pictures before the feathers start falling off. Um, you can get them while they're still fairly well feathered. I mean, get as close as you can. You want to look at your feather quality. You know, you may want to spread out some feathers, get, you know, if you have a macro lens and you can do it, get really close up, you know, get some of those very detailed feather, you know, so you're looking at the composition of the feather. All right. The hard part. And I think this is where everybody's has a lot more questions. I, you know, haven't said anything that anybody doesn't particularly know already. How do you feed during the molt? Okay. So, um, Karen picks on me all the time about this a little bit, but so a molt feed is going to be at 12%, roughly somewhere close to 12% protein. Um, it's going to be a low energy, very high fiber, and we're going to feed a controlled amount, right? So for birds, two to four pounds, you're going to feed two ounces of molt feed. For birds in that four to six pound range, you're going to feed three ounces of molt feed and you need to weigh this. This isn't a guess. This isn't a free choice. So if you're saying, well, I just let my birds eat whatever they want, then you, you can turn off YouTube and go do something else because this isn't for you, right? To do a good molt, we have to be weighing the feed. Once you know a unit of measure, whether it's a quarter cup, eighth of a cup, you can use that, but you need to at least weigh it at some point to know what you're starting with. So would you weigh according to what your birds weigh now or what you want them to weigh at the end of the molt? So my birds would be in the eight to 10, but I would want them to end up in the uh, four to six. Okay, not quite that far, but. <laughs> you can't get from there to there. <laughs> there I, I want them to end up like, so they're at eight and I want them to end up at seven. Do you know what I mean? Like, right. Mm. I mean, obviously you could do three and a half, right? This isn't magic. Yeah. It's not. So it's kind of where your target range is, where you want them to be. So yes, if you are looking for a six pound bird, you want to feed them for that, you know, four to six pound range. Um, <clears throat> not where their starting weight is, but where their target weight is. That's a good question. So where they should be according to the standard or where you want them to be. And for eight to 10 pound birds, you're going to feed four ounces. And that sounds like a lot, but look, this is this is a 50% reduction in calories okay? and it's almost a 50% reduction in protein, right? And so the reason for the really high fiber is to bulk them up, right? So they feel satiated, they feel full, but they're not, you know, they're not full of starches and carbohydrates and uh, fats and proteins. Right. And this is not a cruel and inhumane. This isn't when we talk about forced molding back in the old days, like you would take away their light for, you know, 48 hours and you take away their feed for three days. And if that didn't work, then you took away their water for a couple of days. So that's almost getting to the point of being outlawed, but it's, that's the old term of forced molding. Um, but Theoretic theoretically, you haven't said anything yet that you couldn't just do when the birds choose to molt, right? I mean, so far, all the things you've listed, weigh them ahead of time, feed them a different feed, right? wait till they lose. I mean, theoretically, you could do that for every bird individually if you had the patience for that. <laughs> whenever that yeah, happens. Yeah, yeah you, you're, you are right. You could do that on an individual bird <laughs> basis, but I, you know, <laughs> if you got more point. than 10 birds, I don't think that's going to happen. So otherwise the, you'd have to have them completely segregated. So, you know, the birds have, would have to then be individualized or individual pens. This still allows for grouping. Like you could still run as long as you had enough feeder space for everybody to eat at the same time. You could, you could run a group of a hundred birds and it doesn't matter because you're going to feed a known quantity and based on weight, you know, you're going to feed what they need. You know, but 
Do you have any logic or any knowledge as to why Purina wants to do Feather Fixer and raise the protein during the molt? I hear that a lot. Right? Yeah. And, and so they're, they're already trying to get them out of the molt. They didn't even give the bird a chance to molt, right? And do everything it needs to do. Like it didn't get a chance to drop all of its feathers. Didn't get a chance to lose any body weight. It didn't get a chance to shrink ovaries. It didn't get it. You know, we did, we neglected all of that. I mean, okay. I don't want to get shot for this and no hate mail, please. But here's the deal, right? As chicken lovers, we're trying to help our birds and we want to fix them as quick as we can. Perina is taking advantage of that emotional feeling and saying, Oh, feed this and help them through the molt faster. Well, Okay, so that's what happened. But if we don't lose that internal body weight, the birds might look good faster, but they're not any healthier. So if people are doing breeding, you know, we're not helping perpetuate our line further down the road. We're just going to keep internal fat for another year and add to it and going to compound the problem. Jeff, could I throw a comment in there on yes, that? Sir. Over the past couple of years, I don't know. I, how many folks I've talked to, but they have been, and, and these are primarily large fowl breeders, but they almost to a person say, my birds laid pretty good as pullets. But then when they got into that second year's hens, production went to pot. And I said, probably because your birds are too fat. And I would explain what to do. And, and some did, some didn't, but the ones that did invariably came back to me and said, I tried what you were talking about and you were right. It makes a big difference. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. So a uh, pullet should lay, it's still going to lay the best, right? But the second yeah, right. cycle, the second cycle should be 85 or 90% of what you laid as a pullet. So the great breeders that are out there, they kept track of how many eggs their pullets laid, right? And <clears throat> that next lay cycle should be, like I said, 85, 90% of what the first lay cycle was. The third lay cycle should be 85 or 90% of what the second lay cycle was, right? So they lose approximately 10 or 15% each year in those lay cycles. Now, somewhere out around year four or five, they kind of level off. And, you know, so the fourth lay cycle, fifth lay cycle, they're all going to be, unless we screw something up, they're all going to be pretty much the same. She kind of holds off there four, five, and six, and then seven, she starts declining in eight, nine, you know, she's really tapering off. You know, you're, you're lucky if you're getting eggs out of her at that point, but you know, there are some very productive hens still out at year seven and eight and, you know, enough to create progeny, you know, a high quality egg that you can add so that you don't lose that family line. That is very possible. And. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there shaking their head, like Jeff's lost his mind. He's crazy. Mm -hmm. This ain't going to happen, but it's, yeah, I'm getting a lot of reports of seven, eight year old hens still hatching eggs, still doing fine. <clears throat> but putting them to this mold is part of that procedure. So back to the managing factors on the mold, you need to be in a situation where you can reduce and control lighting on those birds. We need to get the lights down to 10 or 11 hours. So you're going to have to have some indoor housing for them where you can control sunrise. I'm not worried about sunset. I'm worried about when they first see light in the morning. So having that sort of environment or that sort of housing that you can control that light exposure. So the biggest one, and I, I left it for last, is going to be the environment that the birds are in. <clears throat> so molt inevitably happens for most people during the hottest time of the year. Airflow, having good airflow is going to be critical. So you may want to invest in fans or something else to help them. Want to make sure that you got plenty of shade. Try and figure out a way to make sure that they're getting, you know, good, cool water throughout the day, as cool as possible. You can even think about putting ice in a water reservoir that then gravity flows just so that you know that you're getting cooler water. Remember, if they got a fever going on inside of them, everything we can do to help them be more comfortable is going to be good. 
And the other thing to think about is plenty of space. They may need more space than you typically allow them throughout the rest of the year. So they're going to be really grouchy. And like I said, they're going through a transfer. Yeah, I want to avoid cannibalism. So giving them a little bit of extra space, you got to watch their personality and see if they're getting really irritable. We just don't need them to start fighting and carrying on and tearing each other up. That doesn't lead to a good looking bird on the, on the other side. Jeff, I, along those lines, I think some of that is somewhat breed dependent. Uh, your larger birds, Cochins, Orpingtons, Brahmas seem to be very mild. They don't kind of get this flight or flight thing going on during the molt. Most of your dual purpose breeds are, they tend to be on the heavier side. So again, they have a little bit calmer temperament, but where I see it just go absolutely berserk is in some of the game breeds, some of the Mediterranean breeds, those little high energy things. They, they get ill and fractious at the drop of a hat when they're molting. Pretty much any stress, you know, those, mm -hmm. those game year birds, anything that triggers them with stress is going to cause them to want to rip into something. So we just need to be careful and conscious of that. And, um, All right. Can I, can we talk light for a little bit here? Yeah. All right. So right there telling me that I have to control the lighting and reduce it makes me, you know, not want to do it because I don't want to build, I, I'm not going to build inside facilities, just that's not in the cards. But you also said that most birds molt in the hottest part of the year, which is not when the light is. So, I mean, they naturally molt when the light is longer than that. I mean, that's October here or late October in North Carolina when you get down to 11 hours. So can you try it without you the light. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. Look, they want to molt this time of year. That's fine. We're just, you know, if you can get the lights down during this time. So if you can reduce the light intensity. Okay. So just something that Put provides them. Blinders on a little. <laughs> Peepers. <laughs> just something to shade them. So it keeps them. So light intensity is is one of their activity stimulants so you know a little bit of shade they're going to be a little bit more mellow you know less grumpy if they can hang out in the shade no you don't have to get the lights down there but if you do get the lights down for people who want to hatch in the fall we've talked about this before but if you wanted to hatch in the fall then you can start stimulating with light and and gradually bringing them back up right so, and that'll, they'll come back into egg lay, you know, in the fall of the year, <clears throat> but reducing light is going to reduce their activity level or, you know, and their aggressiveness. It's just going to keep them calmer. So the lighting is more of the calmness thing and you got heavier breeds. So they're not necessarily high strung anyway, but for people that might have a high strung breed, keeping them more shaded, more, you know, muted light is going to help out. But if you want to do fall breeding, getting those lights down to that 10 or 11 hours so that you can then, you know, stimulate them back up it is going to be beneficial. Griff, when did you, when did you hatch? Weren't you a fall hatcher? Yes. And, and I did that because I was dealing with the hot temperatures and I was getting big combs and beefy combs and huge wattles. And I found out that by hatching in the fall and then the winter, I could control that to some degree and, and shrink those combs and models back down to where they look more like they should. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to, I know I keep, you knew I was going to do this to you. So that's fine. That's talk again about the stages. So it sounds to me like there almost is three stages. There's like a starting to molt, there is a in the molt, and then there's a coming out of molt. Yes. That, that is true. There's, there's basically three stages of the molt. So you got to trigger the molt and get that where you're dropping that feed down. Hopefully you don't have to take water away, but you know, you're, you're changing over to that other feed. Now to do a humane mold, you know, where you're not doing feed withdrawal and all that other stuff. Look, it's going to take about five, five to seven days to start, really start seeing those feathers falling off. Right? That seems so really not, fast. 
<laughs> yeah. No, they're not going to be bald in five to seven days. No, I but know. But you're going to start seeing a lot more, you know, feathers in the litter, you know, or on the ground. It's going to take five or six, seven days before you start seeing that. It's, you know, they're not going to be bald for a couple of weeks. So I saw somebody had asked, how long do you feed the 12%? Well, you feed the 12% until you until you actually achieve the body weight that you're looking for. So that's going to be the pullet weight based on the breed standard. You know, we're trying to get somewhere close to the pullet weight. Right? Or whatever your birds were. Or the cockerel. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> if you have streaks, it just... You know, and you may or may not go that far. Just depends on how tight of the body, what you want the bird to look for. Like, you know, what is your goal? So for somebody who's more in it on the serious breeding side and not necessarily on the show side, you know, getting them really close to that pullet weight and is going to be really important because that is going to affect that next lay cycle and the number of eggs you're going to get and the fertility of those eggs in that next lay cycle. So that's purely on the owner. Show pokes may only lose 10%. But I think they're still breeding, right? They still want offspring and they still want progeny. So trying to get close to that pullet weight is going to be important. And I think, Rip, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you can get closer to that pullet weight, when you bring them back out, I think your feather quality is by far better yes. when, you, when you drop that body weight. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. Be sure to listen next week when we'll be talking about after the moat care best practices. So until then, be sure to keep your birds happy, healthy, and productive. Mm -hmm.